please become a Patreon and support the show. Merci. And now our host, Stephen Lee Morris. Several weeks ago, we spoke with Luis Alfaro before he was appointed as one of five associate artistic directors of Centre Theatre Group. Now that he has appointed such and has started in on that new assignment, he returns to Anima Farm to tell us what his plans are, what in even his brief tenure he's been able to accomplish and what he hopes to accomplish in the future. Luis Alfaro, welcome back to Animal Farm. It's so great to be here. Another season, right? Another season. <laughs> the last time you were here, you were oh, you were so low on the totem pole. I just uh, you were just a mere professor at USC. You were a mere playwright. You were a mere poet, a mere performer <laughs> with a huge national following. But let's not get into that because I want to emphasize the mere part. <laughs> but now suddenly the tide has changed and you are associate artistic director of Center Theater Group. My goodness, um, you've, you've told me you have now. This brings you up to four jobs, two full-time jobs and two part-time jobs. Let's, let, let's start with that and let's uh, talk about what your plans are and what you're, what are your four well, jobs? You know, well, you know, I'm, I'm a, the new Associate Artistic Director at Center Theater Group and I'm a full-time professor at USC and I'm a playwright, of course, and I keep working on my playwriting and, and then I caretake my mother who has dementia. So, you know, I do that in a kind of, um, what I think is a kind of holistic and an unrealistic but way of moving through the world. But, you know, also, I don't I don't foresee that all of this is forever. Right. That's the thing about art. That's the thing about culture. That's the thing about also living. You can't you can't sustain these kinds of jobs. Right. I'm, I'm seeing all these 10 out of 12, you know, protests and I'm thinking to myself, yeah, you know, um, it won't last forever. One of these will have to give. And um, really, all of them happen for a reason. Right. So. The CTG especially happened because I was just having a moment where I thought, I just don't want to put up with this anymore. And I'm, you know, it's uh, that's really what was think what my thinking in my head was. I put up with to, put up with what, Luis? What's I did the not, problem? I did not appreciate how the theater was expressing itself. And as a citizen of the of Los Angeles, as a resident, as an artist in LA, I felt like I just needed to say something. I have a certain amount of privilege, right? Because I've had history with that theater for a long, long time. And you know, I and I I never want to forget that I the first plays I saw were there. I was an usher there. I came to work there. And, you know, I've come back to work there. So I have a long vested interest in that theater. And I think that um, writing a letter to Michael Ritchie and just saying, hey, listen, not just complaining, but saying, I think um, if allowed, I would like to offer some ideas for how we can, you know, uh, make things better, really. And Michael was very kind and he invited me in. And then um, and then a week later, he offered me a job. So it was really that simple. And it was mostly because I prepared a kind of proposal for what I thought this theater should needed to be doing, which was for me, uh, what is a regional theater if it's not regional, right? So talking about Los Angeles, making art, uh, opening the pipeline of new play development, you know, all the things that we all know, things that we all believe in and love, right? But, um, but were not happening. So that was really, really, the goal was to just to say, listen, I think there are certain things we can do. And here's the way that I would do them. And he was like, okay, let's talk about it. And uh, honestly, the first thing I, I did when, uh, when he offered me the job was, I, you know, I went to USC and I said, I need to take a sabbatical. So I will go on a sabbatical in December. Mm -hmm. So I really will have like very, you know, focused time. In that time, a new artistic director will be chosen. So, you know, what I'm really helping do and the way I'm seeing my life now is, helping a transition, right? Laying the seeds for hopefully what the new leadership can do without sort of imposing something on a new leader that they cannot change, but also really creating a sort of value sets that, that they can really follow. So the first thing I did when I moved in, I moved in, right? <laughs> Back at Center Theater Group is I said, uh, I need to take over the writers group. So for me, writers, you, right? We are the, the heart and soul. We are the, the moral compass of a company, right? So it was really, really important. And they, I think they were six to seven writers a year. They would do a writer's workshop with, and I had been in the original writer's workshop. That's where I found my mentor, Marie Irene Fornes. 
So, you know, for me, it meant a lot to get back. And so I took the writer's group, um, made them give me some money for it, real money for it. And I said, here is what I want to do. I want to increase it from six to 10. I'm going to curate point of view. So I don't want this to be a group decision. I'm going to do this myself. Yeah, very and, interesting. Very right. So point yeah. of view is really important. If you're going to direct, if you're going to create, you have to have uh, a point of view. And then the third thing was I'm going to create, we need to have transparency. So this has to end in a festival at the Kirk Douglas Theater next summer. In July of next year, we'll have a festival of this new work. We have to show the community the work that is being done. here. That is equally as important as bringing the artists in, as allowing the work to be seen, right? And so mm -hmm. they said yes to all of it. And so um, the the point of view, or if I was political in any way, was I selected 10 uh, women writers mm -hmm. that represented, I think, Los Angeles in a very full way. I wrote a letter to the staff and I said, even though we have 10 really sort of extraordinary writers, there are people not in this room that we really have to uh, think about. Uh, the Middle Eastern population in LA, that I didn't get to, uh, Central American writers, which I think are really important. The 65,000 unhoused people that live in our city are also include artists. And how do we talk about maybe one of the most pressing issues of our time, if not working with that community? So little by little, it's kind of not just the idea of creating a writer's group, but creating within an institution, a way of thinking. Can you um, correct me if I if I'm wrong, in some ways, although you, you're putting your own unique stamp on it, you are reviving a legacy of Gordon Davidson, I would think. Yeah. Now, you, can, you can tell me where your vision differs from his, but his yes. was absolutely communitarian. He was very concerned about having various communities within the city of Los Angeles represented inside the doors of his theater. And that was what you were, what you headed one of the workshops that, That's right. uh, that was in residence under, under Gordon Davidson. And um, I, I think for, this is from my memory, I didn't see a whole lot of that play on the stage, those plays on the stage or being seen by the community, which is what you just articulated. Now, what, what, have, I, what have I missed? What have I gotten wrong here? No, I think, you know, Gordon was one of my mentors. And, you know, I really believe that the new play development is central to an artistic organization, a theater's mission. It has to be about not just presenting work, but developing work. And if we don't develop work, we don't tell the stories of Los Angeles, right? So in some ways, um, the, what the theater has done in the last few years is really bring in work from, from other places other than our own, right? Partly because they're not developing the work in, in a very like a robust way. So my goal was really to shift and change that. The other thing that I think is really, really important was um, to give the writers a very decent amount of money, right? So, um, you know, they all got a very decent amount of money, close to what, very, very close to what you would get in a commission. So I'm also saying to the writers, this is a real investment in you as a writer. I believe in your vision. I believe in your story. And this is the way I want to build community with you. So we meet every two weeks. And, uh, and it's extraordinary how fast we're working. So I feel like um, that's just one of many programs that I'm doing, but it's like the one I wanted to start with because I think I wanted to say something to the company about recentering art and artists and not production, but process mm -hmm. and art making into the company again. Now I'm saying all of that because it sounds really cool, doesn't it? I'm not the artistic director. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not. There are five associate artistic directors, right? So let me just say that that I, I came in with the vision and I have a vision that I'm, I'm trying to get everybody else to join me on. But, uh, but very frankly, just to say there'll be an, an artistic director or directors, if they, if they look at other models, that will be chosen. And, um, and I think that will be really, really important. So really, I think for the moment, it's how do you come out of a pandemic? How do you um, come out of a company in, in real, real transition and change? And how do you turn, I don't wanna say right, but how do you shift a ship that big to start to um, not necessarily come back, but to sort of open itself up to the world in a way that maybe we haven't seen. So for me, I'm, uh, I'm very, very interested in uh, how do we talk to Los Angeles again?
How do we talk to Los Angeles in a way that's meaningful? And by Los Angeles, I mean it's artists, right? Yes. The Center Theater Group. Um, well, six weeks ago, maybe longer, we had on this show Jose Luis Valenzuela, who is, runs Latino Theater Company, and he manages the Los Angeles Theater Center uh, for the city. Um, he said a few things, but this was before your announcement was made. Yeah. And um, he said, it, I asked him, can a new leader change the dynamic of that behemoth theater? It's massive, three theaters. And uh, in short, he said no. And this was not anything to do with the personality, the qualifications, the quality of whatever leadership is chosen. He felt it was systemic, it was institutional because it is essentially a commercial venue. It depends on commerce and it has a fundamentally corporate structure uh, oh. that really depends on the programs on the systems that are already in place. And to change those core systems is to um, really jeopardize the stability of the corporation. That was his argument. And he says, there's nothing any individual can do about it. It's larger than any individual. Now you've said you just are trying to persuade them of a vision. I'm just curious how you respond to that. To, to what degree is he right? And to what degree is, would you take issue with what he said? Oh, you know, I love Jose Luis, you know, I'm in, I'm in his writer's group right now, so he's, he's one of my bosses at the moment. Um, <laughs> so, you know, uh, I love him, and I think he's right in many ways, but here's the deal, you know, we have a big, gigantic, gigantic 1,250-seat theater called the Amundsen Theater, right? That theater makes money for the other two theaters to survive, and I would say that if there's a commercial house, it's that house. And um, so, you know, in terms of visioning, I keep looking at that and saying, yeah, of course you want to diversify and do new work in there. But the truth is it, it thrives and survives on kind of booking a lot of Broadway shows, right? Mm -hmm. it, that's what it, that it, what it makes money on. And it makes enough money to support shows at the, at the Taper and at the Douglas. So um, in terms of a model, I think that uh, for me, the Taper is a home of new plays. It's a home for writers. And, uh, and I still, still feel that way. And uh, I feel like that's the place where you can make new plays happen. You have to train an audience to be into that experience. You so have a year to... and a half from now, if you're still in this position a year and a half from now, uh, you, and that would be probably your choice, one or another, and the board comes to you and says, we love this idea of bringing the home. It's, it makes everybody feel so good. It's such, we have such good communications. The problem is nobody's showing up to see these plays at the taper. It's a 700 seat theater. We've got to start thinking about filling the theater. Otherwise it's uh, our grants, our funding, everything is in jeopardy. If we can only tell them, well, we're playing to half houses. We're playing to 75% houses. How do you address that? Well, I, I would say that everything in a company changes. Vision is not just an artistic, right? Vision has to happen in marketing. It has to happen in fundraising. It has to happen in the way the company sees itself. So for me, it feels very, very important to look at what we call a subscription model, right? This is a conversations. And I am, the reason I'm very, very busy is because I'm in a bunch of meetings that have nothing to do, let's say with my art making, have a lot to do with how we sell the art, right? Yep. That have a lot to do with who's coming to the theater. Yes. That have a lot to do to how do we move and change into whatever this new world is, right? So things like membership, which we don't have, things like um, intergenerational audiences that we don't have, of, of you know funding choices we don't go after. All of it is kind of open right now because it is in a moment of transition. But I would say that you know. Um, I'm excited because the Douglas, even in, I've just started, but I've had um, one role in, in picking one play. I've been allowed to sort of join a group in picking one play. The, the first play of the Douglas season is by an LA writer and an LA story. And um, one of the most successful things I think I've done in my few, my few months that I've been there is to guarantee that it's a LA director, LA actors, and all LA designers. So we're not paying a ton of money for housing and all these things that you normally do. You can do it in LA. You can tell LA stories in LA and you can do great plays in LA and do your own standalone productions, right? Mm -hmm. So I know that all of that is possible. It is 
uh, shifting the mindset of how and what work you do. So I would say for me, I don't see it as a kind of big detriment of the tape or, or of, the, of the Douglas. I would say the Amundsen is what it is. And I think one of the arguments that people have all the time is how do you change that thing? I don't know personally, and maybe it's because of my aesthetic, I don't know personally that I want to change that thing. I want yeah. that thing to yeah. give us money in yeah. the same way yeah. that many years ago, I don't remember. I don't know if you remember this, but remember when Gordon stopped all the programming and ran Phantom of the Opera for like all those years. And he made, you know, he basically refurbished and, re, and all the theaters and he got a, he got them back on financial footing just on Phantom of the Opera. Now I'm not saying do that with Hamilton, but I do think that that space allows when you have a hit, if you can run it long enough, it allows you to do something like that. That's very right? smart, yeah. Well, that's also the, the, the benefit of having three theaters as opposed to one. That's right. You, and you, I you think can there's... diversify your, you can do, <laughs> be inclusive and diver <laughs> to use. Well, it's, listen, it's, it's not a surprise to me that, um, that the play of a, a hand in choosing is showing up at the smallest theater, right? Because yeah, yeah, it's yeah, probably yeah, the yeah. most experimental. But also, you know, uh, to be quite frank, I, I also got the company to invest in another younger writer. And and I, I can't say their names yet because I haven't released them, but I will say that um, the two writers that I've had a hand in, they're both still in school. And I love that. I love ha helping young, talented, extraordinary writers go out into the field and start their careers with us right so in a way i've covered i've already forced the hand of my of my company knowing the next year they have to do this other second writer because we've taken an option on his work so in so some say, ways you know here's a really prosaic question and you'll forgive me because you're being quite yeah. lofty and I'm, i keep bringing yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. Uh, i'm not even on the ground i'm kind of under the ground um what what happens if the I, I saw they did a couple of new plays at the Kurt Douglas. And I was, I was a critic of the LA Weekly at the time. And I was cheering them on, going, Good, finally, a local writer. And it got blasted. And, and I personally thought it was a pretty good play. I won't, I won't mention what it was. I thought it was a, a, a very good play. And it bombed. And uh, I, I, I think Michael Ritchie said, OK, we're not doing that anymore. Um, how do you? I mean, the, to what I mean, degree is that? Is that really a do you care if it? There's a thing to be said for also the right to fail, uh, which is something I believe, and I think growth comes through um, learning from your mistakes. But can you afford mistakes, even at the Kirk Douglas Theater? Never mind the Amundsen. It's well, clear. if we can't, if we can't afford mistakes, there's no reason for any of us to be there. There's no reason for me to be there. And so, you know, I keep saying this on staff. Okay, so listen, if we're not going to take risk go get somebody who who wants to do who books four comics on a weekend right if you want to start doing that kind of work right so the truth is and i wrote a letter last night and i felt very very proud of myself for doing this to a really lovely a uh, longtime subscriber who was canceling his tickets because he was having trouble with the diversity of our season this has been going on forever right and i wrote yeah, this yeah, very yeah. long I wrote this very sweet long Talk letter. Talk to Sheldon yeah. Epps about that. Exactly. And, yeah. the, and the letter, in the letter, I said, listen, theater is not a one-off sport. We are here in a long-term relationship with you, Jerry. And I need you to come back and not do this big mistake because I'm having a long conversation with you on the stage through these plays. And if you think that someone like Jeremy O'Harris is, um, is something you don't want to see, let me tell you, Jeremy O'Harris, in many ways is a kind of Joe Orton of his time. In many ways, he's like early Edward Albee. In many ways, he is that generation's writer. He's doing a kind of a work that I think is perfect for the taper. It's gonna be, it's gonna be, you know, um, it's gonna be controversial and I think it's exciting and I think it's gonna be hard and people should wrestle with it. But I think we should wrestle with all of these plays. So for me, I feel like as a good example with this play, the, the first play of the season, I, I have gotten involved in surrounding this play. Right now we have 23 events circling it. These 23 events are high school kids, a junior college, a collaboration with East LA College. I mean, everything, right? Because what I want to do is make sure that before we even get near first day of rehearsal, we are already building the audience for this play. We already want to surround this play with the interest that I think it deserves and the artist that it deserves and the community it deserves. So in, in a strange way, you know, what I'm doing is 
building not just the play itself, but building the audience for that play too. And that sort of has been the story of my life in the American Regional Theater. Every theater I go to, from the Goodman to Honey Hartford Stage to Oregon Shakespeare Festival, I brought the audience with me, right? My job was to develop audience. And, you know, I was resentful sometimes, and you'd sit there and go, oh, God damn it, you still don't have Latinos here? What the hell? But you know what? That is what you do. Now, every play has a certain audience built into it. Let's make sure that audience shows up. These, these plays are not just one story plays. They're built for many, many people. So I think that's another good example of how you work with a department like let's say marketing or education to say, listen, this play works on these five levels. All of these should be paid attention to. It's a play about a mother and a daughter. If we don't do some intergenerational selling here, right? Bring your daughter, free ticket, whatever it is, right? If we don't do that work, we will have shot ourselves in the foot. So I think just every play demands that. And I think that every play is a very special, beautiful um, kind of gift that you get to a community. You want people to join you for the five plays, right? Not everybody's gonna join you for the five plays, but as I said to Jerry, the five plays are a thematic conversation I'm having with you. I'm not even the artistic director and I'm telling them that, right? Those five plays are a conversation that we've started together this season. Mm -hmm. We are engaging. And so my, I think that whoever the leader is, and especially this next season, because it's interim and it'll be the five of us putting the season together on the taper stage. I've said to my colleagues, we must, we must, we must build a thematic season. We must build a season that is in conversation with LA more than ever, more than ever. That's the job we have to do. We have to talk to LA about itself. Even if the plays are not from here, even if the plays in some way, but we already know, you know, that some of these plays have to be about the issues of the day. We have to look for plays that speak to that. So I, you know, I kind of feel like the, my biggest job at the moment is to say, build the writer's group, get these plays and, you know, force the company to, to do one of these plays. I have, I have, I believe. But, uh, you're you're doing something yeah. that's really quite significant, um, which I haven't heard articulated as well as you, you did just now. And that's, you're, taking, you're going to take a risk. You've decided I'm going to be a driver that is going to drive slightly intoxicated. But as such, you're taking out a really expensive <laughs> insurance policy to cover yourself and to cover the theater while you're doing it. So that's all through the marketing and through making the various programs that, that will entice an audience, no matter what it is, no matter what happens on that stage, because it isn't about one critic's view of its success or failure. It's really about, as you say, a conversation with the community. I had a beautiful conversation with Charlie McNulty, right? And, and we, we had a very interesting conversation about, about the type of plays that he likes as a critic, right? But also the kind of work that exists in the city. And in some ways, I started talking about LA and I think I was lofty again. And then I said, LA is, 10 million people, LA County is 10 million people now who speak 224 different languages. I couldn't begin, but I can start to pick away at that. I can start to pick away at the story of our city, which is so complicated and so powerful. So I know that building relationship with civic leaders, building relationship with um, you know, uh, the artists in the community, but also just building relationship with people who are interested and have never been to the theater is just as important. All of those are exhausting prospects, but I think that what you can do is use, use everybody inside the company. First of all, they all have to believe in that vision and bringing and coalescing a company towards one vision is always hard, especially a company that big, but I don't think it's impossible. I really don't think it's impossible because even in my short little time, my short little time, I'm shocked that I was able to do what I'm already doing with the writers program. I'm starting a program for uh, artists just coming out of school so we can have a relationship with young writers just out of university. And then, you know, I went straight into, I wanna talk to who are, the, who are commissions for? It's a really hard conversation. Who is on the commission list? Who are they for? And uh, how do I redirect this? And how do I keep in touch with every single writer? So, you know, calling writers and talking to them about their work. I just had a, the most profound and incredible experience with the great Paula Vogel, a commissioned writer at the theater. What is different about this play and how is this situation 
unique and extraordinary for you? And how are we going to get the best thing out of you? Even you as a veteran writer who supports so many others work, how do we support your work in a way that really matters and really helps you do the best thing you can do? Is that a residency? Is that just you and I talking every week? What is it, right? And so I found with the writers group, it's uh, we were going to meet once a week, once a month, like they do. And I said, no, we're going to meet every two weeks. Every two weeks is a big commitment, but every two weeks, more and more pages go, more and more pages go. And also the dramaturging of ideas, the dramaturging of vision, right? So really, we're moving towards something in the same way I'm moving inside of the company with. I am dramaturging a company with four other artistic team members and I'm doing it completely from artistic point of view. Mm -hmm. I only bristle at the thoughts that um, marketing might have uh, some artistic comment to offer me that is about the work itself. I, I won't tell marketing how to do their work, but I will ask them who is the audience they're going for, right? I will have those kinds of questions. So art making in itself, is what I've been charged with. And, and I'm trying to do it quickly, right? I'm trying to do a job quickly because I imagine that in six months, I probably won't be there, which I would be completely okay with. I think I've planted a few seeds here. I've done something that makes me proud. I had a conversation, as we know, last week was a very painful, painful conversation about gender in the American theater led by our theater's lack of wisdom, I will say. And, um, and so there was a lot of conversations with people and there was a young man on Instagram who called me out and said, you know, I should, I should quit because I am, uh, you know, I'm complicit with, you know, this, this large uh, institutions, you know, mis misguided, you know, approach to producing. And I, so I wrote, I called, you know, I wrote him right away, specifically, I got on his IG and I said, so first of all, let's talk about this because do you know how I work and how, what I've been doing and how we make change and how you can get inside a company? He said, no, I completely blame you. You have all the power. I have no power. And it made me incredibly sad because I thought as he was talking, I thought, even when I first started, Stephen, and you've known me forever, when nobody gave a crap about me, I never felt powerless. I had the power to create an, a, a, a collective, that dark horses group. You know, we just did so much. I never not had power. Well, power, is, you know, to, is what to, I can give myself. To be the devil's advocate, is, is, is there a truth? Is it a different time now? Is it possible that he's right? I, because we're in a different era. No, I disagree. I think an artist, an artist who gives away their, their magic and their power to anybody and feels that they have none is, is not working in their power. It's not working in their artistry. Art gives you, even if no one is interested in you, art gives you the ability to express yourself. Was this person an artist who? who... Yeah, a playwright. And then, you know, I didn't personally know him, but we, you know, we, we sort of exchanged. And, and, you know, it wasn't like a, like, a, like a fight, but it was like, and so I just said, when did you give away your power? Why did you do that? Why did you do that? Who took it away from you? Very That's very not okay. So yeah. I will, I, uh, the other thing I will say is, you know, I've been having some interesting conversations where people come for me and I say, um, I was reading this Nipsey Hussle. Do you know who is the, the rapper? That, I, you know, he has this great quote that says, you know, uh, no one who is doing more than you will ever, will ever call you out. It's only the people that are doing less than you. And I've been thinking a lot about oh, that. Because people good. have been calling that's me out good. and I've been thinking, listen, uh, and I wrote to a very nice subscriber the other day. I said, listen, um, I welcome you and your presence here. If you can make change, where are you? Where are you? And have you gotten up? And, and rather than, uh, you know, sort of like, you know, get, telling me off on Twitter, where, what are you doing? Because I'll tell you what I'm doing. Here I am. I'm laying it out for you. But of course, you blocked me, but <laughs> which is okay. But you well, know what? Well, I, well, welcome to the, welcome to the year 2021. Yeah, this is a hard. This is a hard year. I will say this because I teach, I understand how exhausted young people are. Yeah. I, I I understand the anxiety in our culture. I understand the fear of our culture and I understand the deep, deep desire for revolution. But you know what? This is a theater that demands real change. I've said it to Michael. I love him dearly. He's been very kind to me, right? And I, I've been very, very respectful of him. But I've said to him, change is coming. And part of the, the important part is that you're, you're moving on. 
That is important. That is essential. What we need to do is something very different than I think he can do. And so um, I'm, I'm all about the change. It's the only thing that, that art asks of us is to change with every play, with every production. We Actually, have to you've, be been saying that, you've been saying that for about three or four years. I remember. I have saying. to. Yeah, and yeah. I have to because every time I start a new art project, I have to let go of a lot of people and start new, right? I have to start those relationships new. And, you know, you, you meet a new theater and you need a new director and all of that. But I will say that, you know, the, the, the great lesson here is... Um, the the this is the 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 viewpoints you know Anne Bogart's thing, passion, point of view, craft. I can put a season together because I understand when I read a play, passion, point of view, and craft. And and if I can see all three of those three things in the play, I, I read a pretty good play, right? And I'm looking, I'm looking to read those kinds of plays. People who really have opinions, people who are desirous of the moment they're in, who have deep, deep inquiry, right? And people who have real technique, craft, right? Don't scribble. Really think about the poetry of your play. That is what makes great work. And there is tons and tons and tons of great work. It's, yeah. no, it's not like we have a lack of work. We have to figure out how we funnel that work into the pipeline that creates this, you know, I think really the body of, of, of expression that we haven't seen at, at CTG, because also there has been no development. Well, I can't say no, there hasn't been enough development of work, right? It's, it sort of stopped and it became a bit of a presenting house, right? And it became a lot of other things for a lot of other people. So, you know, this is the moment we're in. This is the moment. And um, the audience either tells you through their purchasing habits, whether they're going to join you or not. But I'm not quite sure that we've invited all of Los Angeles. Well, that was the question. An, an audience is not a block. It's, it's not a herd. It's a, right. a, a singular herd. It's comprised of hundreds of thousands of individuals. And you can, among those hundreds of thousands, I, I have a feeling you'll if it, your job is to reach those that will gravitate towards uh, what you think, the conversation you think is important. You know what I always remember? It was, I don't know if you remember this play because I think you reviewed it. So I produced a play, a tape or two, a million years ago called Slide, Glide, the Slippery Slope. And there was, remember, Dolly the Sheep spoke in this play, <laughs> Kia Cordrin's play. It was a very hard play about African-Americans in science, right? Black people in science. And we didn't market to the right people. And I remember Gordon, and God bless him, because he drove me insane, but he also did wonderful things. And I remember I went to a marketing with, meeting with him, and all the marketing people were yelling at us. They were <laughs> livid with us. And he said, <laughs> he said, it's easy to sell a play that everybody wants to see, but our job is to sell the play that nobody wants to see. Yeah, and in that moment, what happened is we were trying to sell that play to our, our mostly white audience, and we did an about face and we started selling that play to social groups, black, uh, a scientist group we found, you know, like all these groups that had something to do with the subject matter of that play. Yeah. And it shifted that play from like 30 people at the tape or two to like, you know, 250, 300 people. And it was just because that play found its audience. Every play has an audience. I promise you every play, even like the most, down and out shaggy play as an audience for it, right? And we, we need to create those marriages. That's our job. Our job in the theater is to bring you to the work and hopefully you become an investor and hopefully you're not a one-off. Hopefully you want to see theater because you love storytelling. You love stories and you love seeing yourself on stage. And that's important. Louis Salfaro, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> you know, it goes so fast. <laughs> <laughs> Next week, we're joined by Lisa Shurga, an alumnus of The Groundlings, who is back at The Groundlings to direct their latest sketch comedy series, A Groundling on Elm Street. <laughs>